wait is a little time just for me. Am I ever said that one? Oh, yeah. Stop the world. It's spinning too fast. Ever said that one? If I don't get some downtime soon, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. We should stop meeting like this. When a life event forces us to stop our normal routine, and a lot of times that happens around a death in the family. Family reunions, yeah? I need a break. I just had one, so that's not me, but maybe, right? I doubt that there's anyone in this room who hasn't ever uttered one of those statements or something similar. Why is that? Well, because we're busy. Time marches on. Because we fill our days with stuff that has to happen and then pile on more stuff that really doesn't have to happen, thinking that it does, and then we wonder why we're perpetually exhausted. Often to the breaking point. What would happen if we changed all of that up just a little bit? Martin Luther was known to say that he didn't have time for prayer, so he would start his day with three hours of prayer. Three hours of prayer. Yeah. It's amazing how time with the Lord refocuses us and forms our priority list for our better good. Try, try these on. Try these every once in a while. Give it a shot. I didn't have time for that, but I needed it. Somebody confessed to me yesterday. They slept till 3 p.m. I said, well, your body's trying to tell you something. You needed it. Because God created me, maybe time for me isn't just about a luxury as much as it's about time with God so that I can really breathe. Being still and being quiet is not always laziness. It is necessary for my sanity and therefore everyone else's. I'm not in this mess alone. God is with me, helping me through this mess. I felt like an alien on my own planet, so I decided to regain my territory and focus on why I'm here in the first place. I feel more at peace when I have time with God, so I'm going to put him first and see how the rest of it shakes out. I will tell you, my mother was so fearful that when I became a minister, I would ditch all of the piano playing. But if you're ever here during the week, you may not find me in my office. You might find me sitting at that piano having my Sabbath time with our Lord. Music therapy, pray and play, whatever you want to call it. The preaching on this text is literally preaching to the choir. Because you are all sitting here <laughs> on a Sabbath day, remembering it and keeping it holy. It's still scripture, and we still need to pull some stuff from it. Because we all know people that we love that say, well, I get my time with God hiking, and there's nothing wrong with that. But don't abandon time with your faith family. That's where you learn and grow and stretch differently, and it's scriptural. We are fully capable of making jail cells out of our lives, choosing to make them more complicated than they need to be. And there's Jesus saying, come to me, I will give you rest. But Jesus, that's so inconvenient. I don't have enough time as it is. How am I going to make time for you? That's not handy. We often forget that the most worthwhile parts of life are too easy to grasp when we rid of all of our handy concepts that so complicate our lives. There's a reason why the phrase in Mark's gospel says, in the time of Abiathar the high priest. That's important. I could do an entire sermon on that, but I won't. Some brief thoughts, though. He was the son of Ahimelech. So if you're in Bible study, we did Ahimelech. Yeah, okay. The lion sleeps tonight. You remember that? That was from the priestly clan of Eli. He was the only person to escape the massacre of King Saul when many were attempting to help David. So when David became king, he appointed Abiathar along with Zadok as priest in his royal court. So when David was forced to leave Jerusalem, Abiathar and Zadok protected the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, from certain danger. His loyalty to the will of God led him to suffering quite a bit for his faith, and he was eventually defrocked as a priest in Jerusalem. 
he took up his cross. Yet his name means Father of Abundance. Isn't that fun? It's amazing, isn't it? He risked everything for the sake of his relationship with God, and he lost most of his connections worldly, and his life wasn't ever described as handy, not once. But it was described, his name means full of abundance. If Abiathar is just a story about a guy, if we can't take scriptural wisdom from other people before us and how they lived their lives as examples, their sermon that might show up, then there's always Jesus. Kind of like, if at first you don't succeed, go back and read the directions. Do we realize that the real freedom of the gospel comes when we recognize that godly focus takes those self-imposed pressures off of us, those things that we allow to get into our armor of God way too much that throw us off course? You know as well as I do, when something is obvious, we go after it like a dog with a bone. And when it came to the obvious of Sabbath and law, Jesus gave critics the holy duh. That's what I call it, the holy duh. What part of feed the hungry, even on the Sabbath, don't you understand? What part of healing the sick, even on the Sabbath, don't we get? And why can't we understand that the God we serve gave us gifts for godly use, whatever time it is? And the key to all of that is godly. Is it godly? It's putting our priorities together in a way that honors God more than all of our time fillers, and there are a ton of those. Sabbath is often treated as leftovers. Warm them up when you need them. And when this gets done, and when that gets done, and when I scrape up some time after all of my desires are satisfied enough, then I will honor Sabbath. Again, you're sitting right here, and thank you. But there's people in your life that maybe you can influence. Jesus blatantly tells us that the Sabbath is made for man. God who made us and sanctified us wants godly moments for us. He wants in there, never to be extricated. God earnestly commanded that we spend time with him. Tell me, if we're going to ignore your spouse, how long would that relationship last? If we ignore our children, how successful will that relationship be? If we don't spend time con concentrating on what God is doing, we won't feel the need to honor him because he's an afterthought. If we choose to take part in activities that take us away from faith-building experiences, how can we expect to get much out of those? How can we expect those around us to place value and priority on God himself if we are not doing that either? Sabbath is not meant to be handy for us at our discretion. Sabbath is meant for us to form a solid relationship with God, whether it is feeding the hungry or healing or in his word or just shutting out all of that other stuff that we pile on top of ourselves. Sabbath is a command. Sabbath is a gift of time with God to work on our relationship with him, which will then help our relationships with everyone else. And then there's this guy with the withered hand, right? This man was inside the synagogue before Jesus got there. That's a faith statement in and of itself. This man could not achieve the godly results he wanted from his life because he actually had an impediment that kept him from doing so with regularity. Don't we all know folks also who seem more focused in their walk with the Lord through the difficulties that they face? Like, this thing's not going to stop me. I'm going to that synagogue. I'm going to ask Jesus to heal me. There he was, with a physical stumbling block to his service, to his life. And the vultures in the church waited to catch this. It's the Sabbath. What's Jesus going to do with this guy? If Jesus defied the law, they could stop him in his tracks. So Jesus gently spoke to the faithful man first with an invitation to healing and then told the church police what he wanted them to hear very clearly. This man needs help because he was being held back when he wanted to serve. The godly thing to do is not watch him suffer. The godly thing to do is to heal him. And Jesus knew he could. 
The church leaders were silent, and Jesus was ticked that they went silent. The scripture says he grieved at their hardness of heart. This is praying for your enemies, the short version. You got problems? You pray for the ones that are hurting you. You pray for hardness of heart to soften. That's how you pray for enemies. What are we here for other than worship of God and love of neighbor? Yes, there are rules. There are commands. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. But where also is your godly head to discern helpfulness in the kingdom of God? That's Jesus' point here. It is easy for us to read this account and think, well, I'm physically okay. This is not about me at all. This is about that guy with a withered hand. But it is all about us, myself included. We who run ourselves ragged into a withered state of being. May not be our hand, might be what's going on in here. Without being in the synagogue, waiting on the blessings and healing that Jesus, our Savior, provides for us. Jesus is here. Jesus is stretching out his hand to us and asking us to stretch out our hand to him. Why? So that he can restore us on his timetable. Physically, mentally, spiritually. Sabbath freedom is about restoration. It may not be handy for us, but it will be restorative when it is a consistent priority one way or the other. Next to eternal rest in the Lord, Sabbath is the closest we get here. This should sound familiar from 2 Corinthians 4. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. This is Sabbath in a nutshell. This is resting in the Lord, the earthly version. When we spend devoted time with the Lord, we receive healing of withered hands, withered spirits, withered fill in the blank that's necessary to withstand all of the things that work against us. Jesus was a risk taker. He risked relationship with family. He readjusted their attitudes by pointing them to his father. Jesus risked public ridicule, questioned the thinking of cultural leaders who wanted to write him off as crazy, woohoo, because his power was a manifestation of God's power. And they didn't have it, they were jealous. Jesus pointed out the misgivings where supposedly godly people were putting their priorities, and they did not care for that at all. I could avoid this, but I won't. It is a Christ-like thing to lovingly remind people that the church is not a building, though we love it. We do. It is not a building. It is a gathering space designed for praise of God. The gathered is the church. We learn about words here. We take sacraments here. It is a Christ-like thing to gently remind folks of every age that what we teach our children and each other through our actions, what we say and what we do, is a sermon. (laughs) It does have an effect on everyone here and there. When your pastor says, I'm taking some Sabbath time and it's during the week when you think they should be attending to other things, they might be avoiding hypocrisy at the same time they're reminding you that your family, your soul, your spirit would benefit from being part of the faith community that's observing the Sabbath. I've also heard preachers say this, well, I'm on during worship, that's work for me. If you're working that hard during service, you're not prepared. This is not work for me. This is praising God with you. The work comes before. This is praise. This is a precursor to heaven as far as I'm concerned. The command is to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Time with the Lord that's not an individual sport, but dedicated to worship and praise with the gathering of all of the saints, whether that time frame is now or at 8.30 or a Saturday night or a Wednesday morning, whenever that is. It is about being able to understand that things of this world, even if they can be helpful, will not ever be able to stack up or provide the peace of God in the way actual time focusing on God does. 
I spoke in Sunday school about happiness as a residual, but joy as the bubbling up from the inside. Your joy from the inside affects your happiness. Because if you do a checklist of happy and don't have the joy, you don't get anywhere. We have been given the most precious gift ever from our loving Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. They, with the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, beckon us for relationship, for time, for dedication, for more than just handy Sabbaths or conveniences. God wants our Sabbaths to be about healing and restoration in Him that we cannot get from anywhere else. God provides reconnection through His love and care, encouraged, not refused. Come to the waters of baptism and be claimed and cleansed, he says. Let me love you. Come to the holy meal and taste Jesus' forgiveness for you. Let me love you. Come and pray. Let me love you. Did you know there's people that come here during the day, during the week, just to sit here and pray? I love that. Come. Come and drop your burdens at the foot of Christ's cross. Let me love you. Come and receive the Sabbath that God has prepared for you because of his great love for you. Come. We praise the creator and sustainer of that invitation to Sabbath. Amen.